also let us not forget 11 years later on 9-11-2012 in Benghazi. We lost four of Americans under attack that they were told to stand down militarily and the ultimate disgrace of our country at that time and even heard our Secretary of State testify, what difference does it make now? Makes a lot of difference. And we need to make sure we never forget what happened on that day because a lot of our children, just like you and I, we, we look back and we studied things in history and we, we kind of look at them as events that occurred, and they were. But there are some things that absolutely rattle you to the cage and they will, they will absolutely make sure you understand what's going on. And our way of life was attacked. It was not attacked by a nation. It was attacked by radical Islam with the idea of trying to destroy what we are and what we were made about. As I look back at that time, I remembered uh, the resolve that came out of our country, the patriotism that seemed to pick up, the partisanships that kind of dissolved for just a little while anyway. And I began to remember that it was a nation that had kind of made some resolve to go back to God. There was more talk about soul winning. There was more talk about revival. There was more talk about uh, stepping forward with our, our, our way of living again. There was a lot of talk about getting back to churches and getting back to, to ministries and getting back to things. And, and I, as I remember that, and I, I thought as I looked through Scripture, there's a, there's a prayer that's found in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, and that's where we're going to be at uh, most of this morning. But in, that, in Daniel, chapter 9, Daniel's not kind of famous for this prayer. He should be. I mean, he's famous for praying. But we never knew what he prayed until he got to chapter 9 and we see one of his prayers. Daniel chapter 9 is famous because it picks up around verse 20, 21 and he, that vision that God gave him that goes into the 70 weeks and, and all the prophecy and the Bible prophecy that comes into that. We know the book of Daniel for uh, the story of the fiery furnace and the lion's den and, and those are the previously in the early chapters. But just tucked away right there in, Dan, in Daniel chapter number 9, it's a, it's a time to win. It was a time that Daniel was doing something and Daniel was doing something I think each one of us need to do. Daniel was having his daily devotion. Amen? And as Daniel is having his daily devotion, he began to, to read some scriptures. And we're going to find out in just a second where he was reading from. And uh, he was doing, a, I guess, a study, so to speak, on the book of Jeremiah. Isn't it nice to know that you hold in your hand this morning the same book that Daniel studied when he was a young man? Actually, when he was an old man. He's 80 about now. And so as Daniel's having his morning devotion, I guess we would call it, or any time devotion, he notices something and he, he has a driving desire. Something needs to happen in his life. Something needs to happen in the people that are around him. And so he decides that I, I need to check something out. And as he starts reading the Bible, the Bible comes alive to him. The scrolls begin to stir him within. Isn't that what it's supposed to do? Isn't that what our Holy Bible should do to each one of us? The more we know, the more it should stir us to do something. It should bring a closer relationship to God. It's not a book, as I tell you all the time. It, it, we don't study the Bible for information, but for transformation, to see what a difference it can make in our lives. So let's stand together now and open your Bibles to Daniel chapter number 9 and verse number 1. He's going to give us a time frame of this. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which were made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. So he just told you, I've studied the Jeremiah the prophet. By the way, Daniel believed in the inspiration of Scripture. He said the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah wrote it down, and I'm reading what God said to Jeremiah, so I'm reading God's word. He says that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord, and to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. You can be seated. Something happened to Daniel. Daniel is reading in the prophet Jeremiah. 
And Daniel runs across something, and Daniel says, this is about 538 B.C. somewhere in there, and Daniel has been in captivity for quite a while. In fact, there were three captivities that brought the children of Israel there. And if you start looking back, Daniel was in that first captivity that brought him along. And uh, the Babylonian captivity. And then he went to the captivity of the Medes and Persians. Isn't it interesting that Daniel was such a godly man and such a different, unique character that when one enemy overthrew the other enemy, the second enemy still kept him as prime minister. Now figure that one out. The Babylonians, he had risen under that kind of power because of his intelligence and because of who he was. And now he looks around and they get overthrown. And guess what? He's still got a job. Integrity will give you job security, by the way, even with your enemies. And so here's Daniel having his daily devotion. And he runs across something. I, I'm sure he began to do a double take. I'm sure he pulled out his calculus. Right? And started ciphering some of that new math for him. I'm sure he, he didn't use Common Core, amen? He'd still be counting today trying to figure out the number of years. He said, you know, God just said to Jeremiah that there's going to be 70 years of desolation. And Daniel's thinking, well, well, you know what? From the time I was, we're about year number 69. What would you feel if you believe the Word of God like we do, amen, and you ran across a portion of Scripture that gave you unbelievable promise, that said to you, whatever it was in your lifetime that you were experiencing, God had a promise for you, and guess what? You just ran across it, and guess what? You're within 12 months of that promise. Man, that's good stuff. <laughs> Daniel could have said, you know what I think I'll do? We got 12 more months here, and then God's going to bring us out of this desolation. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to write it out. I mean, you got the promise of God, right? It's going to be true, right? So ain't nothing I can do to change it, right? So I'm just going to sit down, keep living life like I've been living it, and in 12 months, hey, hello, Jerusalem, here I come. Now, remember, he was taken as a young man in his teens. And so Daniel is flipping through the scrolls. And, and over in the, in the book of Jeremiah, he runs across a, an interesting portion of Scripture. In Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse number 11, it says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. God just put a time frame on it. God had told Jeremiah, as it was going to pass, it's only going to be 70 years. How would you like to know you're only going to have trouble for 70 years? Amen. You're only going to be driven out of your land and out of your home and away from your kin folks for 70 years. Then in Jeremiah chapter 29... Daniel leads, reads a little bit further in the book of Jeremiah. Verse number 10 says, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years shall be accomplished at, the, at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts... Oh, this was Miss Cena's favorite verse of the Bible. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. When is this going to happen? At the end of the 70 years. The people are going to have to do something. They're going to seek God with all their heart. God's telling them, here's what's going to happen. And you'll find me if you seek me after this captivity. And then in verse number 14. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity. And I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Man, what a promise. 
Daniel's looking at this thing. It's within sight. There's a, there's a light at the end of this tunnel. Things are going to happen here. God's going to do some amazing things for us. God's fixing to take charge. God's going to do something. But you know what? It drives Daniel to do something else. We just read where it said that Daniel was going to go off into some kind of prayer. That Daniel was going to go into something that was interesting and, and moving him. Why? What has prompted Daniel to do this? What had driven Daniel to that prompting? It was he studied the Bible. And once he understood the scriptures, guess what? The scriptures made a difference in his life. In fact, he searched the scriptures and that made him go off into supplication. When you learn something from the Bible, does it drive you to your knees? Does it drive you to want to have a closer fellowship with God? It should. That's, that's what's happening in our lives. That's sanctification. That's the growing process. Notice when Daniel said he was got, what he was going to do, he was going to start praying. Well, really? Daniel? Think about that. Does that sound like an oxymoron? Daniel saying, I think I'll start praying. Well, dude, that's why you were in the lion's den. You, you, Daniel was a man of prayer. Three times Daniel would go daily and, and face Jerusalem and make his prayer and supplications be made known to God. This is something. Even, you know what Daniel just said? I'm going to pray more. In fact, I'm going to not just pray. I'm going to put on sackcloth and ashes. I'm going to mourn in my prayer. I'm going to ask God to help. I'm going to fast. This isn't rub it up dub things for the grub. This ain't that kind of a prayer. This is, God, I got some serious business I want to talk with. Why? Joy comes in the morning. Look, dude, just start marking the days. Deliverance is on its way. And Daniel said, I know. And that scares me. Scares you? What did you just find out? That should, man, Daniel, you should be tap dancing, dude. You ought to be happy. What, what's happened here? Daniel has a desire. Daniel has a desire for his country. Daniel has a desire for the people of Israel. Daniel has a desire for his national fellowship of people around him. Daniel cares for his country. And they've been put off into slavery and bondage because of their sin. And God said, I'm going to come to you in 70 years. And I'm going to release you. And they're getting close to the end of time. Daniel has found it. And Daniel's excited. But Daniel wants one nation back to God you see Daniel's noticing something deliverance is near hallelujah times around the corner put on your walking shoes bless God we're going home Jerusalem's right there the city of God is right there but we're not ready after 69 years and old and on to seven Daniel says wait a minute God the reason we're here is because of sin. We've got some serious business with God to make sure we're right with our God when He does come to visit us. It's not enough to say the Lord's going to take all the problems away. It's not enough to say in the sweet by and by because bless God we're living in the nasty now and now. And our people, are you ready for this? Our people are not ready for deliverance. We're going to go back to Jerusalem just as sinful as we left Jerusalem. Oh God, give us one nation back to God. We need a nation, oh God, that is different. And so Daniel says, I'm going to begin to pray about this. The prompt led him to the prayer. The studying of the scriptures and finding out of the truths and the blessings and the promises of God made him realize one thing. I love God's promises, but are we ready to have God's promises? We scream and we cry and we beseech and then we sing, God bless America. Are we ready for God's blessings? We'll never be deserving of them. None of us ever are. It's by His mercy and His wonderful grace. And Daniel even admits that in a moment, and you'll see that. So what is this prayer of Daniel? I tell you what, this is probably the model prayer of the Old Testament. 
where over in Matthew you find the model prayer of the New Testament. If you go through this prayer and see it, and we'll walk through it a little bit this morning, you'll see several things. The first thing you're going to see is the prayer acknowledges several things. The prayer will acknowledge something each and every step of the way. The first thing that this prayer acknowledges is the sovereignty of God. Look with me, and we're going to be flipping down through these verses together now, so have your Bible handy, because I didn't put them on the screen for you. He talked about God's sovereignty in these first set of verses. And as he comes down through these first set of verses, verses number 4 through uh, 19, in those verses number 4, verse 4, he says, I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. And said, O oh Lord, the great and dreadful God, sounds like that psalm we read just a few moments ago, our God is terrible, amen? Great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love Him and to them that keep His commandments. Over in verse number 7, listen to how he describes God's sovereignty. O oh Lord, righteousness belongeth unto Thee. Do you understand that's God's character, is righteousness. God is not righteous because He does right. God is righteousness. God is the standard of it. God can't do wrong. <laughs> God can't even think about doing wrong. <laughs> to the Lord, in verse number 9, To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. Look at all He's talking about is God. Verse number 15, he says, And now, O Lord, our God, Thou hast brought Thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and have gotten Thee renowned. O Lord, in verse 16, According to all Thy righteousness, I beseech Thee. Look at what he's coming to God on. Notice how many times he uses that phrase, O, oh, O, oh, O oh Lord. Oh God, that was a cry of desperation. It wasn't an introducting. It wasn't that he was stumbling over words. You know how we do that, right? When we start praying, if we can't think of nothing else, we just say God's name. Right? Oh Lord, we appreciate what you're doing for us today. And, and Lord, we ask you to help us. And, and, and oh Lord, right? Daniel's not, Daniel's groaning. Daniel's hurting. Daniel's heart is broken. He's got the promise of God that in 12 months, basically, I'm coming to visit and bless God. Freedom is there. Your 70 years is over. And Daniel's going, this is great. Oh, God. Oh, Lord. You're, you're coming. You're the great God. You're going to visit us. You're the dreadful God. You're, you're coming over to where we are, God. You see us. You're the covenant-keeping God. You're the God of His Word. You're the God of His promises. You're the God who, who watches over those who love Him. Lord, three times He says that you are righteous. He says, God, you are the God of mercy. Oh, I love this one. And you are the God of forgiveness. Oh, Lord. And Daniel begins to cry out to God in that prayer. If you and I ever expect to have one nation back to God, we better realize who God is. Who God is. Well, unless we have a proper perspective of God, we will not have a proper perspective of anything. You understand that statement? Your view of God determines your view of everything else. Everything else. The way you think about people, the way you think about home life, the way you think about your children, the way you think about the way you think of our country, the way you the way you handle money, everything. Everything is determined on how you acknowledge God in your life. And Daniel came to the realization, God <laughs> I better do some serious praying before you come back. Do you believe that Jesus is coming? Do you understand that truth? Folks, 
we better do some serious praying in sackcloth and ashes and fasting before he comes back. Because he's going to come back in great power and great glory. He's going to come back and, and handle things. Notice what Daniel did. Daniel acknowledged right then and there the sovereignty of God. The, I love the word sovereignty. Right in the middle of sovereignty is the word reign. You know what that means? God is God and you're not. God is in control of everything. Everything. So that drives Daniel to do something else. He now has to acknowledge sin. He looks around his country. And though they have been in captivity for almost 70 years for punishment of sin, they know why they're there. God told them why they're there. God told them in advance why they're there. By the way, read your Bible. He'll explain to you why you're where you are too. Amen. You'll find it. And hopefully it'll drive you to the point of, I've got to get back to God. I've got to have a proper view of who God is. And then I've got to have a proper view of sin. In, in those same set of verses, verse 5, he says, We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy statutes. That pretty well summed it up, didn't he? What have you been doing wrong? Everything. <laughs> what have you been doing right? Very, very little. I've been praying three times a day, though. And I go to my window and I face Jerusalem. In fact, Lord, I prayed so hard about that that it, it got me put in the lion's den. Made me a famous Bible character. I'm the who's who of the scriptures now because of my prayer life. Really? Looks to me like you're busy doing something else without everybody else. He says in, in verse number 6, Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets. What's their sin? Rebellion, iniquity, wickedness, departing from the precepts. You're not going to like the next phrase. Not listening to the preacher. What does he know? He's just a man. Amen. I know misery loves company, right? Welcome to our world. Sinners saved by grace. You say, well, what gives you the right to stand up there and tell me about my sin? Because I'm telling you about mine new at the same time. We're all sinners. And he says, look at what's happened. We have turned off and we've neglected the preaching of the scriptures. We've neglected the listening to the word of God. He goes on in, the, in verse number 9. He says, we have rebelled against him. You're in captivity for rebellion. And what are you doing in captivity? I'll show God. I'll still not listen to him. Really? <laughs> That's their attitude. You would think <laughs> a 70-year time out might work. Amen? Time out. <laughs> that was some time out, amen. He goes on and says, Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord. We, we were not just listening to the prophets when they preached. We were not just rebellion against you. We weren't just doing wickedly. When we knew clear cut, thus saith the word of God, we chose not to obey it. I could look at it. In black and white. And say, I understand what the Bible says. And here comes that word that we all know, right? But. I know what the Bible says about that. But. I, I don't know if I agree with that. Oh, well, talk to the boss. He wrote the book. Pick it up with him. Find out what he has. Uh, I, I know what it says I should be doing. And I just think, there's your problem. Amen? I learned a long time ago, when I start thinking, I am not adequate. Because I don't have the proper equipment. Now, when I let the Holy Spirit teach, oh, there's a whole lot of thinking I can do then. 
You see, I can learn then. You see, I have to obey. I transgress thy law, he says in verse number 10. We have not obeyed your voice again. We've sinned against him. In verse number 15, we've sinned and done wickedly. He acknowledges the sin. He, he doesn't hold it back in either. He uses some pretty graphic words to describe the sins they're involved in. He, he doesn't try to soft pedal it. He doesn't try to change the name of the sin. You know how we do that. Amen. We, we, we change the name of the sin to protect the sinner. So the, the guilty person doesn't feel so bad. He's not a drunk. He's got an addiction problem. He's got an alcohol problem. He's got No, he's a drunk. He, he don't have four kids with, with four different women. He, he's just a, an absent father. He's a whoremonger and a deadbeat dad. Amen? We, we've come to this man. Daniel doesn't. Daniel's the one to look. If we're going to get ready for God's deliverance, if we're going to get ready for God's blessing, if we want to get ready for the end of judgment, and we want to become... And he's not talking about just personal. He's talking about national. If, hey, I'm preaching of a storm. And we look and say, look at this thing. If we're going to do this, we've got to call sin, sin. But listen, it begins in the house of God. I, I, I know what we do, folks. And we have to be careful because here's the next thing he acknowledges. He acknowledges the sovereignty of God. He acknowledges the sins that they're committing. And then he acknowledges who the sinners are. Mm. Now, when I study my Bible, and I do pull out those great characters of the Bible that we like to study their lives, and, and, and if we're not careful, we almost make them turn into, you know, Superman and Batman and, and Peter and, you know, you, no, 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 no. They're real. And when we get to Daniel, the one word I would probably never use to describe Daniel, though it's true, I just wouldn't use it, sinner. That dude was integrity all over. Wisdom. Consistent. Obedient to the word of God. Love God. Prayer warrior. Oh man, James had to have had him in mind when he said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. He could have went ahead and the Holy Spirit should have just went ahead and said, like Daniel. <laughs> We'd have understood that. But notice in verse 5 as he begins this prayer, what does he do? The first word of verse 5. We have sinned. The humble Daniel, the prayer warrior, the man who hangs around with guys like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This Daniel, the servant of the Most High God. This Daniel, the discerner of dreams. This Daniel is a sinner. And the first person he labeled a sinner was himself. America is in a mess. Did you know that? And we can scream and rant and rave about Congress, about the House of Representatives, about people from San Francisco. We can talk about the Wicked Witch of the West. We can do all that we want. But America is where America is today because... I have sinned against God. We have sinned. We need to have that level of humility and understanding. Yes, we have poor leadership. Yes, we keep electing them. Yes, we are sinners. He says it in those verses, verse 6, we hearkened not Neither did we hearken. Who's the sinners? We are. And then he starts getting a little more specific. <laughs> In verse number 9. <laughs> Who is that? Our kings. Our princes. Our fathers. <coughs> excuse me. And all the people of the land. Who are the sinners? 
Yes, bless God, our kings are. Our, our, our governmental leadership. You don't think they're sinners? Open your eyes. But look, we understand that concept because we know we're sinners too. But why does it, when they act like sinners, it surprises us? They're lost, a majority of them. By their own testimonies, they deny the name of Jesus Christ. Now, they'll say his name, and they'll tell you they're praying for you, and they go through the religious gumbo, but they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. There's no fruit to evidence that, and then the things they will say later on reveal that they don't. Our kings, our princes, our fathers. Getting a little closer home now, ain't he? He went from the governmental heads down to the little local princes, boys. And now, okay, let's go to the house. And then he just said, you know what? All the people of the land. I searched around, Daniel says, and I looked. And you know what I found? Everybody that lives around me is a sinner. He goes on to say in the verse 7, <coughs> excuse me, the men of Judah and the inhabitants <laughs> of Jerusalem. The city of God? The place where the temple was? Temples lay desolate for 70 years almost. Boy, they got to have a work day when they get back, amen? They've got problems. He said, you know what? The people who inhabit the city of God, the city that's the center of the world, all of them people, with all of their religion, they're sinners too. I love the phrase he uses in verse number 8. He says, O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face. <laughs> and again he says who the sinners are. Our kings, our princes, and our fathers. He uses the word we and our numerous times. You know what the phrase confusion of face means? He's got that bewildered look about his face. <clears throat> Confused look, a look of pondering. He says, oh, Lord, to us, we have confusion of face. I'm trying to discern this. What is it they're trying to discern? We have a confusion of face. Every false god in the land had a different what? Face. No matter what it looked like, it was a false god. No matter what you called it, it's still a false god. We've got confusion. Of we don't know which god to serve. We don't know what god to look at. We're trying to discern from right and wrong. We're trying to figure out what is the right way. You know why? Because men are calling evil good and good evil. And here we are, God's people. <laughs> Trying to figure it out. Why are we trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong based on the world's standards? Because we've hearkened not unto the preacher. Because we've hearkened not unto the voice of God. You see, when we get further away from the scripture, we have to discern based on political correctness. It's, again, the changing of the name of sin. That's a false god. It's got three eyes and a, a crooked nose. That's a false god. It's got a horse's face. But which one am I supposed to serve? One's the god of fertility and one's the god of stamina. How about you serve the one that don't have a face? How about you serve the one that Paul says, here's the unknown god? How about we serve the god that we're not supposed to make any graven images to? How about we listen to the word of God and we know we don't have to. You realize this? We don't have to discern what's right and wrong. God tells us. When we start trying to discern, that means we're not listening to him. If I've got to figure out if something's right or wrong, and the Bible tells me point blank it's right or wrong, why am I trying to discern it? There's people today trying to figure out what the right thing to do in their life is when the Bible is clear-cut. 
Here it is. Daniel acknowledged who the sinners were. He acknowledged the sin. He acknowledged it and held back nothing. He talked about, notice how he contrasted those with God. God is great. God is awesome. God is, and we're sinners. We're wrongdoers. We've changed the things around us. You see, they weren't ready for revival. They weren't ready for redemption. They weren't ready for deliverance. Yes, they're God's people. And yes, God made the promise. And yes, it's going to happen. But are we ready for it? And Daniel said, no, I've I got to stop. I've got, got to get into some sackcloth. I've got to fast over this thing. God's coming soon. And we're not making a difference in our world. God's coming soon, Daniel. I know. I've got to repent to where I've been lacking. You've been lacking, Daniel? Yes. This happened 24 years ago. I'm sure 24 years ago some of you remembered it. Because it, it, it hit the Baptist press in a heartbeat. On January the 23rd, 1996, a fellow by the name of Joe Wright, Pastor Joe Wright, prayed before the House of Representatives in Kansas. At least at that time, they were letting them have prayer every morning to get started. <laughs> and they would invite special guest pastors to come in. <laughs> Usually the pastor would present the House of Representatives, the, the chairman of the House, with the written prayer so he could go over it. Pastor Wright didn't do that that day. Here's his prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says, woe to those who call evil good. But that's exactly what we've done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and have inverted our values. We confess that. We have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word and we call it pluralism. We have worshipped other gods and we call it multiculturalism. We have endorsed perversion and called it alternate lifestyle. We have exploited the poor and we call it the lottery. We have neglected the needy and we call it self-preservation. We have rewarded re laziness and we have called it welfare reform. We have killed our unborn and we call it a choice. We have shot abortionists and we say we're justified. We've neglected to discipline our children and we call it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it political savvy. We have coveted our neighbor's possessions and we call it ambition. We have polluted the airways with profanity and we call it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored value of our forefathers and we call it enlightenment. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts today and try us to see if there be some wicked way in us. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free in Jesus' name. They didn't ask him back. It's time you and I do that from our pew. Our country is in a mess. We're calling evil good. We're shooting police officers in, as they're sitting in cars. Netflix has come out with child pornography. And we call it entertainment. We call it looting. They're stealing. It, 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 it's, well, they're getting what they deserve back for all those years that they were mistreated. We're sick. We as a nation are sick. But the nation is sick because our churches are sick. And we need to bow our face before a holy God and say, I've got to repent in sackcloth and ashes. God, I've got to fast and I've got to pray. 
God, I know I'm a sinner. God, what is it that I'm doing wrong? What is it that I'm not doing that's right? God, help us. Help me to make an impact in my nation. Help us as a church make an impact in our community. Help us as a nation. God, forgive us for where we are. We need you again, God. We will never see America great again until America is one nation back to God. Then we see his plea, and that will be my final point. In the section of verses from 11 down to verse number 19, Daniel does three things in his plea. The first thing he does is he recognizes something. Look at what he recognizes. Yea, verse 11, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they may not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. Here's why we're here. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we've sinned against him. Moses told us what was going to happen if we sinned against God. The scriptures have told us. We know where we're at. I recognize where I'm at. Do you recognize where we are and why we are there? Verse number 12. And he hath confirmed his words which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. We're God's special people. Yeah, quit being so cocky about it and do right. It's that arrogance that's got them where they're at. One of the popes said years ago, we no longer have to say, as Peter and John, silver and gold have I none. The Catholic Church is rich. And a fellow answered him and says, yes, but you also cannot say, and in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. We've traded wealth and riches for the power of God. For the demonstration of the miracle of God doing life-changing things in our churches. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Therefore hath the Lord watched upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth. For he, we obey not his voice. God, you're not to blame for this. Isn't it interesting that some of the prayers of the scripture are seeming like they're not necessary? In the book of the Revelation, when the, the saints are praying to God and they say, Oh Lord, how long will thou wait? How long? Seven years. You know the answer. But it's driven them, knowing the truth has driven them to even, John wrote, 22 chapters of what's going to happen in the future. And he concludes it by what? Even so come Lord Jesus. Well duh. He just, you just wrote 22 chapters. He is coming. So why are you asking him to come? Because the truth made a difference in him. The, we need to recognize where we are. And why we're where we are. Recognize it. It's not God's fault. God's not to blame. Man is. Lost men, but more interesting, redeemed men. Then he has the second thing he does is repent. Again, that blows my mind when I think of Daniel, amen? I know he was not perfect, but man, sinner and repentance is not something I think of when I think of Daniel. He says in verse 15, And now, O Lord our God, Thou hast brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and hath gotten thee renowned as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee. Notice he doesn't come up to God and say, Lord, this is your servant. You need to bless your servant. God, you need... No, no. I come to you on your righteousness, not mine. Let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because of our sins 
And for the iniquity of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. God, I'm begging you and I'm coming to you. God, you brought deliverance to us out of the land of Egypt. And here we are today and we need your deliverance and it's coming. But God, we've done wicked and we repent. God, we're wrong for what we've done. And then he makes a request in verses 17 through 19. He says in verse 17, Now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications and cause thy face to shine upon the sanctuary that is desolate. Why? For the Lord's sake. Lord, I, I have one request. Hear what I'm praying. Please hear me. And let your face shine on the sanctuary in the holy city of Jerusalem. For one reason. Your glory. For your sake. Not for our sake. God, don't make America great again so we can be the world's greatest power. Don't make us great again so we can have the greatest, richest economy in the world. Don't make us great that we can become that city set on a hill. God, make us great because you are great. And we want to glorify you. We want you to receive all the glory. Verse number 18. Oh, my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercy. Oh God, I request that you hear me and that you listen to me. You incline your ear to me. You hear it. You open your eyes and you see where we're at. And God, I come to you just based on one thing. Not how good I am, but how merciful you are. And then... Verse number 19. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O my God, for the city and thy people are called by thy name. One nation. Back to God. Undeserving. <laughs> With liberty and salvation for all. That's what we need to be. God, all I want is you to hear. And God, I want you to forgive. And God, I want you to hearken. And God, I just want you to do it. Make us ready for deliverance. Make us ready to be able to inhabit that holy city. God, make us great again. Because not we're great. But we're your people. And you're great. And you're awesome. And you're terrible. And you're mighty. And you're sovereign. And you're Lord. And you're King of Kings. You, Lord, deserve all power. And all praise. God, drive us to our knees. Because we know deliverance is coming. Don't let us sit around and wait on it. Make a change in me so I can make a change here. Let's stand for prayer.